Welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Just a little bit of housekeeping here. I have a correction to make, and it goes all the way back to episode 7 of the show. I'm not sure how or in what context I got this wrong, but the early Islamic leader Muawiyah was the governor of Syria at the time in question, not Egypt, as I apparently stated. Uh, Ibn al-As was the Egyptian governor, and, uh, well, at this point, there will probably not be many people who care about that, but I like to keep things honest around here. Anyway, this is the third episode in a four-part series about the Seven Years' War. At least I hope it will be a four-parter. These things tend to grow, but if you want to make sense of the story, I strongly suggest you start with part one. We are kind of picking up in the middle here. We left off at the beginning of 1759. In Europe, Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, is backed into a corner. He has occupied Saxony, but... Even though he has been able to do that, his forces remain bottled up in central Germany. He is being squeezed by the Austrians from the south, the Swedish from the north, and the Russians from the east. And it seems like only a matter of time until Frederick is forced to succumb to sheer numbers. Meanwhile, the French, who are allied with the Austrians against the Prussians, they have been fighting a costly stalemate against the Prussian allied British forces in Hanover, which sits between France and most of Frederick's land. The Royal Navy is slowly strangling French trade, even while the French have been losing ground in the North American colonies and India. And the new French Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Duc de Choiseau, has instituted a new policy. He's going to husband French military strength in Europe, including the valuable French navy, and he will attempt an all-out invasion of Britain. This leaves the French colonists in North America in an impossible situation. See, the Duc de Choiseau is betting on French gains in Europe to offset inevitable losses in the colonies. Right? If the French can land troops in Britain, or even if they bloody the British army enough in the fighting in Hanover, they can get their North American colonies back during peace negotiations. But in the meantime, the French Canadians are on their own. Well, not completely. There are still some attempts to resupply them, but they're no longer a priority in the French war planning. The French also have another problem in North America, their commander, Louis-Joseph de Montcalm. As you'll recall, he has just won a stunning victory at Fort Carrion in upstate New York against a British force that was so superior in numbers that Many French Canadians are calling the battle a miracle. But Montcalm is running on borrowed time. The French in North America are heavily outnumbered by the British and have traditionally relied on their Native American allies to make up the difference. Unfortunately, Montcalm considers the Native Americans to be inferior fighters, and he doesn't bother to spend time with the tribal chiefs or engage in the kind of diplomacy the natives have come to expect. And all of this happens at the same time that the British are stepping up their efforts with the Native Americans. Remember, they have recently worked out an agreement to guarantee Native American territories in the Ohio River Valley and they've even appointed Sir William Johnson, the Irishman who the Iroquois have named Chief Big Business, as a liaison between the Crown and the Indian nations. So, by 1759, the French have fewer and fewer Native American allies, and the most powerful tribal group, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, better known as the Iroquois Confederacy, they are 
now more or less firmly in the British camp. That said, there are still some Native Americans in the French camp. Many are Algonquins, who are rivals of the Iroquois, and some Iroquois still fight with the French because they want to drive out the Europeans altogether and see the less numerous French as easier to force out than the very populous British colonies. On the other side of the board, the new British commander is Major General Geoffrey Amherst, who has just completed a successful siege of Louisbourg, which is in modern-day Nova Scotia, driving the French out and threatening their access to the St. Lawrence River. And following that success, in 1759, Amherst plans yet another multi-pronged British assault. In the west, he will attack Fort Niagara, cutting the French off from the western Great Lakes. In the center, he will strike north from Albany and make another attempt to take Fort Carrion from the French. This force will then strike north across Lake George towards Montreal. In the east, a British task force will sail up the St. Lawrence River to lay siege to Quebec. The attack on Fort Niagara in the west is an attack of opportunity. William Johnson, chief big business, has spent much of the winter negotiating with the Iroquois and the Seneca tribe, the Iroquois nation that lives in the area, have decided they want to expel the French. So they ask Johnson to bring British soldiers to help. Johnson travels to Amherst, who agrees to attack Fort Niagara this year. It's on his to-do list from William Pitt anyway. He organizes a force of 2,000 British regulars and 1,000 colonial troops under the command of Brigadier General John Perdeau. William Johnson will be second in command, and the roughly 1,000 Iroquois troops will serve as auxiliaries under the command of their own chiefs. They don't answer directly to any of the British. The march to Fort Niagara across upstate New York, it's uneventful, and the British force arrives there on July 7, 1759. Pierre Pochot, the French commander, has fewer than 1,800 troops at his disposal and sees that he is outnumbered. More to the point, the British cannons are powerful enough that they pose a real threat to his wooden walls. And with too few men to drive the British off, he is in real danger. So when John Prideau sends a messenger demanding that the French surrender, Pacho does everything he can to delay giving a response. He even pretends for a minute not to speak English, so he has to speak with the messenger through an interpreter, which slows things down. And in the meantime, while he is delaying, he sends a messenger to Francois de Lignery, a French commander further south in what is now western Pennsylvania. And he orders Lignery to come north with all possible speed, so Lignery abandons his forts and has his men burn them to the ground rather than risk them falling into British hands, and he marches north to the relief of Fort Niagara. Meanwhile, the British regulars and colonial forces are digging siege trenches around Fort Niagara, and every day Pacho goes to the top of his wall and watches the trenches get closer and closer by the day. And the Seneca chief inside Fort Niagara sends a message to the Iroquois with the British, asking them to negotiate. And William Johnson is so cognizant of how important it is to maintain Iroquois goodwill that he actually lets them negotiate in his camp. Negotiations are tense. At one point, one of the French-allied Iroquois turns to Johnson and accuses him of starting all this trouble amongst his people. And ultimately, the Iroquois with the British army decide to withdraw a few miles away to a forest clearing called La Belle Famille. Now, 
Johnson doesn't talk about any of this in his reports, probably because it makes him look bad. But we do know that the British alloyed Iroquois send a message to the Iroquois in the fort saying, leave the whites to fight. So we can imagine a universe where the Iroquois also abandon the French and the whole thing is a wash. But unfortunately for the British, Pauchot learns of this message and refuses to allow any more contact between the two groups. So now the French are in a better position since the British numbers have been reduced. But the British still outnumber them by something like five to three. So Pauchot is still not in a good position to push them back. On July 19th, misfortune strikes the British. More misfortune strikes them. While surveying his entrenchments, British commander John Prideaux has the back of his head blown off by one of his own mortars while making a surprise night inspection. This makes William Johnson the senior officer on site. But William Johnson does not have a commission in the British Army. Uh, he's a royal official, and he has a commission as a colonel in the colonial militia, but he's not technically in the British Army. So the next most senior guy, a British regular lieutenant colonel named Air Massey, tries to assert command. It doesn't work since the other officers accept Johnson in their, as their commander, uh, but it kicks off a rivalry between the two that colors what we know about everything that happens next. On July 23rd, the British spot Lignore's relief force canoeing along the Niagara River above the falls, making an approach to the fort. And it seems as if they are spotted twice. They are spotted by a guy named Captain James Delancey. Uh, he had been sent with a detachment of men to block the road from the Niagara River portage just in case. And this is where Lignory's force is coming from. Uh, so he sends a messenger to Johnson who sends more men to help set up an ambush under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Air Massey, the guy who had tried to take command. And some sources will say that Massey went out under his own initiative, since Johnson never leaves a record of ordering the troops out. However, he says he, quote, made a disposition, unquote, of his troops, not even mentioning Massey's name. In fact, if you read Johnson's reports, it's literally as if Massey doesn't exist. And this has even led some authors to write about Johnson leading the reinforcements out by himself. But he remains in the main British camp throughout the battle. The other people who spot Lignore's French relief force are British allied Iroquois scouts. They may not be willing to fight other Iroquois, but they're still game for fighting French. Unfortunately, Lignore's 1,300-strong relief force includes around 800 Iroquois, so once again, the British allied Iroquois engage in some lightning diplomacy. They warn Lignore's Iroquois that they're about to march into an ambush, and those Iroquois abandon the French. And of course, William Johnson takes full credit for this, although it's not clear whether he is even involved. What happens the next day on the early morning of July 24th is a perfect ambush. The French, now with much reduced numbers, are marching in a column into the clearing at La Belle Famille. Massey has his men lie on the ground with their bayonets fixed so as to form smaller targets. He positions his New York militia at the far end of the clearing to present an obvious target, and places his elite grenadiers off to the side, again lying prone on the ground where the French will have to march past them. As the French enter the clearing, 
Lignery orders his men to form up in a line to engage the colonial militia. And they redeploy and then start advancing and firing on the move as they continue to dress their lines and get into formation. And this isn't very efficient, and they aren't inflicting a ton of damage on the militia who return fire from across the clearing. And then when the French move within point-blank range of Massey's regulars and grenadiers, Massey orders them to stand and fire. He describes the battle as follows, quote, I never saw a grand division, for so I must call my number, give so plump a fire. After firing seven rounds, I gave the word for the whole to advance by constant firing, which was done in great order, and the most of the 46th fired 16 rounds, end quote. Now, keep in mind that Massey is probably tooting his own horn a bit here. Uh, he calls the 46th Regiment a grand division when it has 130 men in it, but he also gives great credit to the grenadier companies on the flank, which he doesn't directly command, and says that their devastating fire into the French flank is what causes the French to retreat. And when the French start to falter, the British regulars charge with their bayonets and cause them to scatter. With 16 rounds fired and a standard rate of fire of 4 rounds per minute, the fighting probably lasts five minutes, including the bayonet charge. In his report, which reaches Amherst first, William Johnson gives much of the credit to the British allied Iroquois and claims that they fire into the other French flank. This ends up becoming the version that most of the public learns because it's what goes out in the colonial press. But if Massey is to be believed, things went quite differently. In his report, he calls the Iroquois quote-unquote savages who had behaved in a quote-unquote most dastardly fashion. He says that they held back from the battle until the bayonet charge only to quote pull out the prisoners hid under logs and scalped poor wretches after they had fallen by our hands, end quote. So, as is often the case, it depends on who you believe, and there is some evidence to support both sides. What is not controversial is that Lignery's remaining troops are unable to reach Fort Niagara, and make their way north to regroup in the relative safety of French Canada. On July 25, 1759, General Pauchot surrenders Fort Niagara to William Johnson, who once again takes all the credit. The French troops are loaded onto riverboats called bateaux and shipped to New York as prisoners of war. And just like that, the British control access across the St. Lawrence in the neighborhood of Niagara Falls. Amherst leads the central prong of the big strategic attack himself. Now, we've been down his particular road a couple of times already. The British control New York State as far north as Lake George, which is connected to French-controlled Lake Champlain by some rapids and a portage trail. The French have built a fort called Fort Carrion to defend the portage and rapids. And so far, the British have failed to take Fort Carrion. You may remember Montcalm beating back Abercrombie's numerically superior force a year before. Amherst intends to be the guy who finally takes Fort Carrion, but he's more meticulous in his planning than Abercrombie was, and he doesn't set out from Albany until July 21st, 1759. He leaves late mostly because his force relies on the same supply depots as the Fort Niagara expedition, but 
also because he's shoring up British defenses at Lake George just in case his expedition fails and is forced to go on the defensive. Amherst's expedition is much better supplied than Abercrombie's had been a year prior. None of his boats are sunk crossing Lake George, which makes a big difference, and he keeps his artillery moving forward with his infantry and engineers. And unlike Abercrombie, Amherst doesn't do anything stupid like order his men to launch a frontal assault against a defended position without artillery support. He orders his men to dig trenches and for five days they crawl slowly forward, digging a series of carefully fortified trenches that creep closer and closer to the wooden walls of Fort Carrion. They're under French cannon fire the entire time, but on July 26th, the French spike their cannons, disabling them, and set fire to their powder magazine, and retreat in good order. It turns out that there had only been 400 defenders. This whole French defense was just kind of a show to delay the British, and at a cost of only five dead and 31 wounded, Geoffrey Amherst has finally taken what is left of Fort Carrion, which the British will rebuild and call Fort Ticonderoga. As is his nature, Amherst takes his time pursuing the French. First, he sends out a party of rangers to survey their activity. And he's expecting them to rally with more men at Fort St. Frederick, which is a much larger fort that controls Crown Point, a prominent peninsula in Lake Champlain. Take Fort St. Frederick, and you control the entire southern half of the lake. But as it turns out, Amherst isn't even going to have to do that. Uh, His rangers return on August 1st with news that the French have abandoned Fort St. Frederick as well and burnt it to the ground. Further scouting reveals that the French have retreated all the way to Ile aux Noix. That's an island in the Richelieu River, which flows out of the north end of Lake Champlain and meets the St. Lawrence River just northeast of Montreal. With one more push, one strike across the lake and up the Richelieu River, Amherst can force the French all the way back to Montreal, the heart of French Canada. Now, A more aggressive commander would immediately pursue, but Amherst doesn't, and he has a couple of good reasons. For one thing, the French have a fleet of four small ships patrolling Lake Champlain, carrying a total of 32 guns. If Amherst tries to move his force north by boat, the French will just blow their small bateau out of the water. And if you're asking why he doesn't just go around the lake, uh, well, that's because so far, everybody who's traveled the lake has used the lake to go across it. So he would have to build a whole new road, and it would be very expensive and complicated, and it would have to go a ways around a good distance from the lake to stay out of range of the cannons on the French boats. It would be really complicated. Besides all of that, the lake is the best road to Montreal, so Amherst has his men near Fort Ticonderoga build a dockyard in the safe waters at the southern end of the lake. And they're going to build a brigantine, which is a type of boat that's bigger than the French ships, as well as a large armed raft to protect their bateau. And while he's waiting for these ships... Amherst also orders a new fort built on Crown Point to replace Fort St. Frederick, and he has a road built from Fort Ticonderoga to the new fort. He's very organized. Now, like I said, there were a couple of good reasons Amherst didn't pursue, and one is those French ships blocking the lake, 
but the other is probably more important. Remember that this is part of a three-pronged attack, and it's the mid-1700s. Communication moves at the speed of a ship or a horse, and Amherst has no idea how the third prong of the attack is progressing. That's the attack on Quebec, which is northeast of Montreal along the St. Lawrence River. Since Quebec lies between the Atlantic and Montreal, Louis-Joseph de Montcalm expects an attack there and has gathered all of his forces. If he defeats the British attack, he can come south with his larger force and reinforce the French army near Montreal, which would turn an attack by Amherst's men into a suicide mission. So instead of doing anything like that, he builds his ships, fortifies Crown Point, and shores up his supply lines and waits for news. The British attack on Montreal isn't directly answerable to Amherst. For this mission, William Pitt, back in London, has dispatched an independent task force under the command of Major General James Wolfe and Vice Admiral Charles Saunders. James Wolfe is young for a general, only 32 years old, but if you're trying to lead an amphibious assault, he's the guy for the job. If you'll remember, the British had engaged in some half-hearted naval raids against the French mainland in 1757. Well, Wolfe was one of the few men to distinguish himself in those actions. During an aborted attack on the port of Rochefort, he had led a scouting mission ashore to survey the French defenses. When his commander decided to call off the main attack, Wolfe said he could take the city with 500 men and ask to be allowed to try. And while his commander refused, uh, this aggressiveness of Wolfe's came to the attention of William Pitt, who had ordered the naval raids and thought they should have been more successful. In the intervening time, Pitt has now gotten Wolfe promoted, and that's how he ends up in charge of the assault on Quebec. On June 25, 1759, Wolfe and most of his men land on the Isle d'Orleans, which is a large island in the middle of the St. Lawrence River, just downstream of Quebec. And when Wolfe arrives, he immediately realizes that this attack is a daunting task. For one thing, although he does not know the exact numbers, his force of 9,000 British regulars and a few hundred colonial rangers is up against a French defensive force of 12,000 men, although somewhere around half of those guys are local militia. For another thing, even if it were lightly defended, Quebec is a tough city to capture. Trust me, I'm an American. We've tried twice and failed both times. The city sits on a series of bluffs on the north shore of the St. Lawrence, and these bluffs extend downstream to the northeast along the bank opposite the Isle d'Orleans. Upstream to the southwest, the St. Lawrence has a series of narrows that makes navigation treacherous for larger ships. In fact, the word Quebec comes from the Algonquin word Quebec, which means where the river narrows. So it's apparently impossible to attack from upstream, and attacking the downstream shore would put Wolf against an enemy on higher ground. Right? His men would have to fight their way up these bluffs, up, in some cases, narrow pathways that are wide enough for one man. And these aren't just naturally intimidating positions. Uh, Louis-Joseph de Montcalm has spent the last several months shoring up several lines of defenses upstream of Quebec. So even if you land 
way upstream before the bluffs and march along the ground, well, when you get there to the top of the bluffs, between you and the city, there will be a bunch of trenches and uh, other uh, defensive positions. It's not going to be easy. And the French also aren't going to sit idle and let the British deploy their forces and give their sailors a rest. On June 28th, to keep them on their toes, Montcalm has a set of boats set loose on the St. Charles River, a small tributary that flows past the city center and into the St. Lawrence. And the French set these boats on fire along with some rafts that are linked together by chains. And the hope is to have these ships float down into the British fleet and set a bunch of the British ships on fire. But the British lookouts are sharp, and they send out men in longboats to tow the fire ships clear of the fleet. One sailor supposedly asks another if he's ever quote, taken hell in tow before, unquote. At this point, Wolfe seems to be facing a stalemate at best or a defeat at worst. A prolonged siege of Quebec is not an option. He doesn't have enough men to surround Quebec, nor does he have the supplies he needs. If he's not able to take the city by winter, he will be forced to withdraw, which could mean the end of his career or even worse. The British in this time aren't above executing high-ranking officers who fail to execute their orders, or in some cases fail to show sufficient zeal in executing those orders. In his book, Empire of Fortune... Crowns, Colonies, and Tribes in the Seven Years' War in America, American historian Francis Jennings writes, quote, For Wolfe, Canada presented the same problems, to be solved by the same means, as Scotland during the Jacobite Rising. Genocide was not unthinkable. John Preble reports that when Wolfe was stationed in Scotland in 1751, He believed that lingering resistance among the clans might be finally crushed by a contrived massacre, that the deliberate sacrifice of one of his patrols and the killing of the Macpherson's chief would justify the extirpation of the whole clan in reprisal. "'Would you believe that I am so bloody?' he asked his friend William Rickson. As events were to demonstrate, his coyness was only assumed. Wolf was bloody." So much romantic gush has been spilled over his Quebec campaign that a cool appraisal seems like an attack on motherhood. But many mothers are bad ones, and Quebec was not won by brilliant tactics. After several futile attempts to penetrate the city's defenses, Wolfe turned to terror. His cannon played on the city day and night, on its residential areas more than its military defenses. Wolfe was perfectly clear that no military purpose was served by this bombardment because the upper batteries cannot be affected by fire from the ships, and the destruction of the lower residential town gave little advantage to the business of an assault. He ordered scouting parties to burn and lay waste the country. For Wolfe, this was already a familiar procedure. He had previously devastated the Gaspé region while Amherst besieged Louisbourg. Wolfe professed humanitarianism towards women and children, but it did not stop him from sending out the ruthless rangers who killed everyone they could reach. More directly, he threatened to Montcalm that if the enemy presumed to send down any more fire rafts, they are to be made fast to two particular transports, in which are all the Canadian and the other prisoners, in order that they may perish by their own base invention. Wolfe's mercy extended only to surrenderers. Naturally, the civilian population wanted to escape Wolfe's fury by capitulation, but Montcalm also understood the uses of terror, against his own people as well as enemies. When Quebec residents suggested surrender, 
he threatened them with the savages. This was Acadia and Abbe Le Loutre all over again. End quote. Over the next two months, Wolfe tries and fails to assault Quebec from downstream. But against the dug-in French defenders, he's not able to establish a proper beachhead, much less launch any kind of attack. And by the second week of September, he's desperate to do anything necessary to achieve victory. I'm not just talking about a terror campaign, I'm talking about... Any plan, anything, no matter how absurd, that might result in a victory. Now, he proposes a landing and an all-out assault on the French defenses downstream of Quebec, the area that Montcalm has been reinforcing where Wolf has already tried and failed. But his senior officers are universally opposed. So they powwow, and they come up with a plan that is so crazy that there's seemingly no way it can work. See, there is a French supply convoy due soon from Montreal, coming from upriver. If a British force can slip upriver on boats at night and pretend to be French, they can trek their way up a narrow path up the bluffs and reach a plateau north of Quebec called the Plains of Abraham. From there, they could draw Montcalm out or, as an act of desperation, launch an attack on the city. They even find several French-speaking officers who can help them to talk their way past the French sentries. And over the night of September 12th through September 13th, Wolfe's advance guard lands on the north shore of the St. Lawrence, and they successfully talk their way past the sentries, and by four in the morning, they stand on top of the bluff. But Wolfe is in a dark mood. He's been sick, and he may even be dying. In his book, Crucible of War, the Seven Years' War, and the Fate of Empire in British North America, American historian Fred Anderson writes of Wolfe's state in the weeks leading up to this landing. Quote, He had only recently recovered from his fever enough to leave his bed. His consumptive cough was worsening. He was weak from the bloodletting to which he had been subjected, and except for the opiates his physician prescribed, he was unable even to urinate without excruciating pain. His weakness was so apparent that when he collapsed once more on September 4th, the rumor spread throughout the army that he was dying. He himself believed that he had little time left, and begged his doctor only to patch him up sufficiently to do duty for a few days more. End quote. Wolfe seems to have had zero faith that this plan would work, so he has gone ahead with an advance guard of as few men as possible assuming that they'd all be killed and that his second-in-command would then order a retreat to Louisbourg in Nova Scotia. Even if Wolfe were to survive the landing, he could then order a retreat himself and honestly tell his superiors that he tried. But what he never expected was for this plan to actually work, and now he's at the top of the bluff, and he only has a handful of men to attack Quebec with, and dawn is approaching. So despite the fact that the plan has worked, he's in a bad position. And he sends an order to Adjutant General Isaac Barr, who is overseeing the landing, to abort it. Despite his bloody reputation amongst the French and Native Americans and Scottish, James Wolfe seems to genuinely care about the safety of his own men and is willing to die honorably with his advance guard rather than put them at unnecessary risk. But, fortunately for the British, Adjutant General Barr disregards Wolfe's order and continues sending more and more men ashore, and the French sentries keep on waving them past. As the British are reinforcing, the sun rises. 
and French lookouts on Quebec's walls quickly report the presence of the enemy on the Plains of Abraham. Montcalm now has a golden opportunity. He can lead out the city's garrison and attack Wolfe's force while it's still deploying and badly outnumbered. But Montcalm believes that this is a diversion. He doesn't think anyone would be dumb enough to try and move an entire army through the Narrows, past the French sentries, and up the bluffs. Wolfe has attacked the downstream defenses before, and Montcalm thinks that what he is doing here is setting up a diversion to attract a bunch of French troops away from his main attack. As a matter of fact, Wolfe's artillery on the Isle d'Orleans are even bombarding the French positions in that area as a diversion. But Montcalm confuses the diversion for an actual attack, and he doesn't move his garrison out of the city, nor does he call up the bulk of his force, which is positioned downstream in their defenses. But the French in North America have limited resources, right? And while Quebec's downstream defenses are strong, Montcalm has built them at the cost of neglecting his upstream defenses, the ones facing the Plains of Abraham. And as more and more British troops form up on the plains, he begins to realize that this is more than a diversion, and he calls up his troops from downriver. Unfortunately, Montcalm has already waited too long, and now he's not going to wait long enough. In his book, 100 Decisive Battles from Ancient Times to the Present, American historian Paul K. Davis writes, quote, Had Montcalm waited for troops to come up from the downriver defenses to supplement the garrison in the city, he would have stood a better chance of facing the 4,400 British regulars marching on Quebec. Instead, he marched out of the city with a roughly equal force, although only about half were regular troops. The rest were militia. The first French fighters on the scene were Canadian militia and some Indians, who proceeded to act as skirmishers and lay down a harassing fire. Wolfe ordered his men to lie down to avoid this. When Montcalm had his men formed up in mid-morning, he ordered them to advance. The militia fired at too great a range to do any harm, while the British continued to lie prone and hold their fire. As the French line moved forward, it began to lose cohesion. The militia fired and then knelt to present a lower target as they reloaded. The regulars fired in volleys, reloaded, and then marched forward. By fighting in two different styles, the mixed forces found themselves falling apart even before they got into range of the British muskets. The British stood and fired by volleys when the French reached 60 yards. The platooning ranks kept up a steady fire. When the French reached 40 yards, the British line took 10 steps forward and fired a volley that shredded the French lines. They broke. The entire fight had taken no more than half an hour. Tragedy struck both sides during the battle. Wolfe was hit by sniper fire first in the wrist, then in the abdomen, and then in the chest. He died on the field. Not long afterward, Montcalm was hit, probably by grape shot from the two cannon that the British had pulled off the bluffs. He was taken into the city and survived until the early hours of the following morning. End quote. The troops Montcalm had called in from the downriver defenses arrived to find the city already in a panic, and most of them desert. Ironically, the French supply convoy, along with 3,000 troops from Montreal, arrives just a few hours later. But when they see the British in control of the high ground, they return to Montreal. The next day, September 14th, the civilian governor, the Marquis de Vaudreuil, evacuates the city. And on September 17th, Quebec would officially surrender. The fall of Quebec leaves the French in Canada entirely bottled up in Montreal, 
without access to the Atlantic or the Great Lakes. Without supplies, they are on their own. The next year, in the summer of 1760, the new French military commander makes a desperate attempt to retake Quebec. The battle outside the city walls is fierce, and the British defenders are ultimately forced to withdraw back inside. But they've spent the winter repairing the walls, and ultimately the French are forced to retreat. Meanwhile, Geoffrey Amherst leads yet another one of his three-pronged attacks. The British and colonial forces are to attack the French from Quebec in the east, Lake Champlain in the south, and Lake Ontario in the west. The British have more than 18,000 men in total, which would be a minor army in Europe at the time, but represents an overwhelming force in these sparsely populated colonies. And now, in the face of this threat, the dominoes start to fall for the French. Canadian civilians, rather than resist the British, willingly let them pass. Native American allies suddenly turn neutral and seek peace with the British. By late summer, Montreal itself is under siege. And on September 8, 1760, the Marquis de Vaudreuil decides that enough is enough and officially surrenders Montreal to the British. This will mark the end of French control in Canada, although there will be sporadic local uprisings throughout the rest of the war. There won't be anything serious or anything that really sticks. The British really win the war in North America in 1759 with the successful campaign that leaves Montreal isolated in the first place. The British public end up calling 1759 the Annus Mirabilis, which means wonderful year. And it's not just because of their success in North America. During 1759, the British win just about every battle they fight. In India, a French force of 8,000 men besieges the British in Madras, their southern trade capital, but a British relief force of just a few hundred men is able to drive them off. In the Caribbean, a British naval expedition conquers the island of Guadeloupe. This might not sound like that big a deal, but Guadeloupe is a major producer of sugar, which is an incredibly valuable commodity at the time. It's worth so much that in the post-war peace negotiations, the French will cede all of Canada to the British in exchange for that one little island. From the French perspective at the time, though, in 1759-1760, these are just temporary setbacks. Remember, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Duc de Choiseau, and his plans. He's banking on victory in Europe to make good any losses in the colonies. And a big part of this European plan is his invasion of Britain. Now, the French fleet at the time has 43 ships of the line in home waters while the British fleet has 40 in the British Isles. But 12 of those French ships are in the Mediterranean. To join the others in the Atlantic, they have to pass through the Strait of Gibraltar. And on the evening of August 17, 1759, as the French fleet sails through the strait, it's spotted by a British lookout. Now, the British Mediterranean fleet, with 15 ships of the line, is currently anchored in Gibraltar, but they're not in ideal shape to pursue. The ships have been refitting, and they're in various stages of disassembly. But they set off on a moment's notice with partial crews, since many of the men are on shore leave and can't be rounded up fast enough. Most are commanded by junior officers, since a lot of the captains are having dinner 
and they're too far inshore to reach their ships in time. As they're pulling out of port, uh, many ships are still attaching the top portions of their masts and rigging sails that have not been properly fitted. But the British have an ace up their sleeve. Seamanship. Despite the Duc de Choiseul's deepest desires to invade Britain, he has only been in charge of France's military for a few months at this point. That is nowhere near enough time to change a naval culture that is nowhere near as professional as the British. The French are also faced with the problem of land borders that need to be defended. They always need to have a number of soldiers inside France just in case something goes wrong. And the British don't need to do that because they have the English Channel and the Navy is their first line of defense. I mean, yes, they have a garrison force in the home islands, but if the British are fighting a battle in Kent or Dorset, then something has already gone seriously wrong with the war effort. Anyway, the French in the 1750s don't just invest more in the army and less in the navy on an institutional level. They do it on an individual level. So while French soldiers are pretty well paid for the time period, French sailors are not. Not only that, but conditions on French ships are horrendous. People talk a lot about the inhumane way the Royal Navy treated their sailors during this time period, but whatever the abusive behavior may have been, it does not shine a candle to what the French sailors were dealing with. Literally nobody wants to be a French sailor. And in the summer of 1759, the French Navy is understaffed by around a third. And these low-paid, ill-treated sailors have less money for drills, so they're not as experienced as their British counterparts either. And so this British fleet of 15 ships of the line is able to catch up with the 12 French ships, despite having to put together their rigging on the go, and they're able to sink two, and they're able to capture three more ships. Two of the French ships make it to the Atlantic port of Rochefort, and the remainder are forced to take shelter in the neutral Spanish port of Cadiz. In the process of making their escape, some of the French ships try to slip through neutral Portuguese waters, where it would be illegal for the British to attack them. But the British fleet pursues anyway, and some Portuguese ships end up firing on the French as well. The Portuguese have been allied to the British for some time, yet have so far remained neutral in the Seven Years' War, and this breach of neutrality will end up damaging relations between Portugal and France, which becomes important later. And this naval battle is part of an August 1-2 punch. Because on August 1st, a British Hanoverian force defeats a superior French force that is attacking east across the Rhine and into Hanover. This pushes the French back, ending any threat to Hanover for another year. This means they can't rely on making any gains in mainland Europe for the time being. Their only remaining gamble for 1759 is the invasion of Britain, which they will have to attempt with a now denuded navy. British Admiral Sir Edward Hawke is in charge of blockading the east coast of Brittany, the French region where the invasion is expected to come from. He's developed an innovative system for maintaining a perpetual blockade. He's constantly rotating a few ships at a time back to the mainland to refit and resupply, so the bulk of his squadron can remain on station at all times. But on November 7th, 1759, 
Stormy weather forces Hawk's fleet to pull further off the coast. And this same storm forces a few French ships, returning home from the Caribbean, to take shelter in the port at Brest, where French Admiral Herbert de Brienne, Comte de Conflans, is waiting with his fleet for an opportunity to slip out. And he's trying to slip along the coast to a place called Kiberon Bay, where the French transport fleet and invasion army are staged. But when he heads out on November 15th, the winds are erratic, and it takes five days for him to make the journey. And in this time, British Admiral Hawke has made his return, and then followed the French fleet. And not far outside Kiberon Bay, he finally catches up with the French. Conflans' fleet makes a break for the bay despite the rough waters, but the British move to intercept. When he realizes that he has no choice but to fight, Conflan forms a traditional line of battle, with his 21 ships of the line sailing one behind the other, prepared to sail past Hawke's fleet, who he expects to form in a similar line of battle with his 24 ships. That's kind of how things are done in this time period. The navies line up and sail past and shoot at each other in an orderly fashion, and it's why decisive battles are rare. Tough to get much of an edge over the enemy when you're both being cautious and using the same exact tactics, but Admiral Hawke has something else in mind. Returning to Fred Anderson's book, quote, Hawke, one of the most imaginative and certainly one of the boldest officers in the Royal Navy, had ordered an attack under weather conditions so severe as to be all but unthinkable, in winds that would have made line-ahead battle tactics impossible. Trusting in the superior seamanship of his crews, Hawke therefore hoisted flags signaling general chase, in effect ordering his captains to attack at will. And then despite high and rising winds, crowded on all the sail his ships could bear and bore down on the French without regard to the hazards of the bay or the ferocity of the gale. If judged by the conservative standards of the day, Hawke's order to initiate a general melee represented a decision of incredible audacity or foolhardiness. Its effect on Conflan and his captains was almost stupefying. The British swarming around them like wolves around sheep, kept the French from forming a defensive line. Then, through a short and sanguinary afternoon, fought in no discernible order. Ships collided, crashed onto rocks, ran aground, and bombarded one another with convulsive fury in a virtually indescribable action. At evening, in the midst of the storm, darkness came on so suddenly that the combatants broke off contact and anchored without attempting to regroup. Only when the light gathered the next morning, as the storm still howled, did the result of Hawke's attack become clear. Only two French ships had made it back to sea and run before the gale for shelter further down the coast. Two had been sunk, one had been taken, a fourth had run aground, a fifth had limped off to sink while trying to escape. The tempestuous dawn also disclosed to Admiral Conflan that in the darkness he had anchored his flagship, the Soleil Royale, in the midst of several British ships. After running aground in a vain attempt to escape, he refused to surrender and ordered her abandoned and burned. Seven French vessels, aided by the high storm tide, had made it into the mouth of the Vilaine River. End quote. Hawke spends the next few days trying to pursue the French ships upriver, but is unsuccessful and ultimately resumes his blockade of Brittany. It is not necessary 
Only three of the twelve French ships that sailed upriver would end up being salvageable. The remaining nine are hopelessly stuck in the mud and have to be abandoned, and along with them any hope of invading Britain. If you're William Pitt in London, this is all excellent news. As a matter of fact, the British and Prussians are already in peace talks with the French and Austrians, and the British are winning all over the map. This puts Pitt in a perfect position. If the French offer good terms, great. If not, the French fleet has been decimated, leaving the British fleet free to inflict further damage to France's colonies. But if 1759 is an annus mirabilis for Britain, it's an annus terribilis for Prussia. And for Frederick the Great personally, it may just be the worst year of his life. It may be tied with 1761, a bit of foreshadowing there for you. Through most of the year, Frederick remains pinned down in Silesia, the lower part of Germany that he controls. Austrian Field Marshal Leopold Joseph von Don sits just inside the Silesian border, in a position where he can strike further west into Silesia or north towards Brandenburg, which is Frederick's main homeland. So Frederick has no choice but to keep his main army in place and shadow Marshal Dawn. Meanwhile, the Russian Empress, Elizabeth Petrovna, has ordered General Pyotr Soltikov to advance into Germany from the east. So far, the Russians have occupied East Prussia, which is on the Baltic coast and separated from Brandenburg by a strip of Poland. And while Frederick is able to keep Marshal von Don from linking up with Saltikov, he is not able to move his army all the way up north to stop the Russian advance. So in June, Frederick sends a smaller 26,000-man force under the command of a sub-commander to stop the invasion. But the Russians have 41,000 men, and they have the high ground, and the fight is a disaster for the Prussians. And following this defeat, there is nothing stopping the Russians from advancing into Brandenburg. Von Don sees the opportunity and sends 24,000 men north to assist Saltikov. That's less help than the Russian general had asked for, but enough to occupy the city of Frankfurt on der Oder on August 3rd. Now, this isn't the Frankfurt. The Frankfurt is in Hesse, which is not part of Frederick's realms. But Frankfurt on the Oder is on the west bank of the Oder River, which at the time is the boundary between Brandenburg and Poland, and, oh, this is also Brandenburg's second largest city. Some of Frederick's cities have been sacked before, but for the first time in the war, one of Brandenburg's major cities is well and truly under enemy occupation. This occupation actually opens a rift between the Austrians and the Russians. So far this year, the Russians have done almost all the fighting, while Field Marshal von Don has done nothing but sit around near Frederick and send a small portion of his forces to help the Russians. What he's doing is sound military strategy. He's tying down Frederick's main army while the Russians wreak havoc in Brandenburg and wreck his economy. But it's bad optics. And Austrian Archduchess Maria Theresa realizes it. She doesn't want to look like a bad ally, or just as bad, a weak one. She orders von Don to attack Frederick without delay, and even absolves him of any responsibility should he fail. And despite this order, Von Don lazily creeps forward at a rate of a couple of miles a day, and the ever-colorful Frederick calls him, quote, the fat excellency with a lead butt, end quote. Anyway, when he 
hears that the Russians have Austrian help and have penetrated into Brandenburg proper, Frederick does what he does best and takes his men on a forced march. He takes them north to Frankfurt under Oder, but when he arrives, he learns that the Russians and the Austrian armies are actually on the other side of the river, the east side, about five miles from the city. And this should be a warning to Frederick. Why is the main Russian force behind the city, behind the river, instead of out in front to keep Frederick from retaking the city? As it turns out, Saltikov has chosen his ground well. He has just beaten the Prussians in a defensive battle when Frederick had sent that first 26,000-man force up to deal with him. And he has no problem doing it again. He has occupied a series of ridges southwest of the village of Kunersdorf, and his men have dug trenches and prepared their defensive position. Frederick crosses the River Oder on August 10th and reconnoiters the battlefield himself on the evening of August 11th. This is another mistake. Frederick used to rely on his hussars, his light cavalry, for reconnaissance. But he has slowly evolved his hussars into a strictly combat-oriented force. So now he's effectively blind, and he tries to make up for it by surveying the Russian positions through a spyglass. Well, a spyglass can only give you so much information. It can't tell you what's behind a line of trees. It can't tell you what's over that hill over there. That's the kind of information that you need real scouts to go out and gather, and Frederick doesn't have it. Now, his plan is to strike hard at the rear of the Russian formation, basically do an end around them, knock them off the ridge from a direction they're not expecting, and then cause the rest of the Russian and Austrian forces to flee in panic. But without good reconnaissance, he does not realize the full strength of the Russian positions, nor does he know where the Austrian troops are in reserve behind them. At two in the morning on August 12th, Frederick breaks camp and leads his men in a long march several miles around the Russian positions, then attacks at dawn. It's a hot day, already muggy at daybreak, and he intends to roll up the Russians as fast as possible before fatigue sets in in his men. Unfortunately for Frederick, his spyglass reconnaissance was insufficient to the task. Instead of approaching the Russians from the rear, the position he thought was the rear, was actually the right flank. But there's still a possibility for success. If he can break one flank of the Russian army and drive them back and keep pushing forward, we entire army is liable to panic and run. This has happened a lot in history, and that's what Frederick tries to do. And the initial Prussian attack goes exactly as he hopes. Frederick's artillery open up and pound the Russians on the ridge, specifically targeting the Russian artillery pieces and knocking them out within a few minutes. His cavalry then charge the hill and easily force off the Russian infantry who are hiding in their trenches to keep clear of the cannon fire. After quickly regrouping, the Prussians move down the other side of the ridge to advance on the next Russian position. But to do this, they have to cross a valley, and off to their right, where Frederick never got to scout, are a bunch of Austrian grenadiers who attack them from the flank as they try to cross. So instead of this nice, smooth advance that's just going to sweep away the panicking Russians, 
Frederick's men get bogged down. This allows the Russians to regroup. General Saltikov is able to bring some fresh men into the fight, and the fighting in the valley is chaotic. In his book, Frederick the Great, A Military History, American historian Dennis Showalter writes, quote, The Austrian grenadiers formed a firing line on the far side of the valley. Reinforced by further Austrian and Russian troops, they shot it out at point-blank range with their equally determined adversaries and stopped the Prussians in their tracks. According to one account at least, Saltikov substituted prayer for tactics during this phase of the battle. His behavior reflected conditions in the front lines at least as clearly as a more orthodox style of command might have done. Frederick had originally intended to commit his infantry in echelon, the better to probe for flanks and weak spots. But by now, the field was shrouded by a thick blanket of powder smoke. Confused officers tended to lead men half-paralyzed by thirst and heat to the sound of the heaviest fighting. Battalions piled up one behind the other, so disorganized that it proved impossible even to relieve the sorely tried units in the front lines. Major Ewald von Kleist, one of Prussia's best-known poets and bravest fighting men, was mortally wounded here. Cavalry from both armies attacked and counterattacked with no result, not least because the infantry on both sides were too densely packed to make flight a readily available option. End quote. To try and force through, Frederick sends in the best of his cavalry. Led by a veteran officer you may remember, Frederick Wilhelm von Seydlitz, one of the guys who built Prussia's cavalry into the force that it is. Von Seydlitz's charge successfully drives off the Russian cavalry but then runs into Russian infantry who fire a close-range volley that badly wounds von Seydlitz. While he will ultimately recover, his wound forces him to withdraw and leaves the cavalry to his second-in-command. Showalter continues, quote, His successors in command possessed neither Seydlitz's energy nor his coup de lui. Fresh Russian and Austrian horsemen closed in on Prussian troopers already disorganized by close-range artillery fire. The 6th Dragoons, whose nickname of the Porcelain Regiment embodied the army legend that the regiment had been originally acquired from Saxony in exchange for tableware, rode into a range of a Russian battery and was put out of action in a matter of minutes. Other regiments seeking to disengage and rally found themselves penned against lakes and ponds, or driven into boggy grounds where their heavy mounts were no match for the steppe ponies of Saltikov's Cossacks and Tatars. Some of the Prussian troopers were forced back into the ranks of their own infantry. For men who had marched and fought for sixteen hours, much of the time with empty canteens, for men who had seen their ranks decimated, not least by Prussian cannoneers who seemed to pay no attention to the color of their target's uniforms, this was the final discomfiture. Frederick subsequently dismissed what began around 5.30 as the absurd fear of being transported to Siberia. Perhaps there may have been some feeling, conscious or subconscious, that if the Russians were by no means immortal as individuals, they were close to unconquerable en masse. With battalions reduced to the strength of companies and companies melted to platoons, they held their ground at bayonet point when their cartridges ran out. And over it all lay the sickening smells of blood and excrement, the clouds of powder smoke that blinded eyes and thickened tongues, the growing miasma of confusion. It was the Prussians who flinched first. Lack of ammunition furnished the overt excuse for seeking safety in the rear. The infantry's ammunition wagons had no chance at all to overcome the obstacles of soft ground and Russian artillery fire that seemed deliberately to seek out any target larger than a single man. It took only minutes for unsteadiness in the ranks to flare into full-fledged panic. No one, officer or man, wanted to be the last one left to hold on a stricken field. 
Frederick, whose decisions had contributed so heavily to the catastrophe, plunged in to stem the tide. Two horses were shot from under him. His coat was pierced by musket balls as he seized a regimental flag and shouted for a rally. His words were lost in the roar of gunfire. His example went for naught when some of the Allied cavalry, instead of pursuing its defeated Prussian counterparts, turned instead on the infantry. Battalions that by now consisted of no more than a few files around the colors broke and ran for the shelter of the small woods and copses dotting the field. Frederick rallied a few hundred men in an effort to form a new line, only to see them melt away under Russian canister fire. A few beacons guttered through the fog of defeat. The Prussian artillerymen, from whom traditionally no sense of warrior's honor had been expected, fought their guns to the muzzle. A Silesian Fusilier regiment, converted from labor troops only the previous year, advanced from its inglorious assignment of guarding the artillery park. Surrounded in minutes, the rear echelon soldiers made a heroic stand in a square until, all hope of relief gone, the survivors grounded their arms in surrender. Frederick himself had a musket ball stopped by a snuff box he carried in his pocket and was saved from falling into the hands of the Cossacks only by the desperate charge of a detachment of the Zythan Hussars. End quote. The Battle of Kunersdorf, as it comes to be called, is a complete disaster for the Prussians. Out of an army of around 50,000 men, Frederick has lost nearly 20,000. He's lost several key commanders, along with his brand new horse-drawn artillery and half of his expensive 12-pounder guns that are nigh impossible to replace during wartime. In the hours after the battle, he resigns command of the army, and he writes the following letter to his minister in Berlin, Graf Finkenstein. Quote, I attacked the enemy at three o'clock this morning. We pushed them as far as the Jewish cemetery near Frankfurt. All my soldiers performed prodigiously well, but that cemetery made us lose a considerable number. Our people panicked. Three times I rallied them. At the end, I was nearly taken prisoner myself, and I was forced to leave the battlefield. My coat is shot full of holes. Two of my horses were killed. I am unhappy to still be alive. Our losses are very great. Of an army of 48,000, I have 3,000 left for the time being. At the moment I write, everyone is fleeing. I am no longer master of my people. In Berlin, they would be best advised to think of their own safety. It has been a cruel change of fortune. I shall not survive it. The consequences are going to be worse than the battle itself. I have no more means of helping, and if I am honest, I believe that all is lost. I shall not survive the loss of my country. Goodbye forever. End quote. But then, something amazing happens, or more accurately, does not happen. At this time, Frederick believes the Russians and their Austrian cohorts are going to pursue him. He only has a few thousand men left. And if the Russians strike now, they can pin him against the River Oder and end the war right then and there. When they don't, Frederick says it's a miracle, and it even gains a historical name, the Miracle of the House of Brandenburg. And it ends up being one of two miracles that saves Prussia during the Seven Years' War. Well, all right, it's not really much of a miracle. See, the Battle of Kunersdorf was a battle of attrition, and the Russians have suffered nearly as many casualties as the Prussians. The only difference is that Frederick's men have run away, and most of them are scattered throughout the countryside at the moment, while the Russians, the survivors, are back in their camp. General Saltikov jokes that if he wins another such victory, 
he will have to deliver his report to the Empress in person, since he will have no one left to send to deliver it. In other words, his army really isn't in any condition to pursue what is left of Frederick's. And he's also dealing with the same issue every Russian commander faces in this war. Logistics. He has expended a lot of artillery shells, a lot of ammunition, stuff that he's going to have delivered from Russia, and it's going to take until next year. So instead of waiting until next year, he cuts a deal. He makes an arrangement with Marshal von Don for the Austrians to take over responsibility for supplying Russia's troops. This seems like a good solution, but the Austrians barely have enough supplies to take care of their own men, and indeed, von Don ends up prioritizing his own troops. Now, this does have some advantages. It allows him, later in 1759, to occupy most of Saxony, including the capital city of Dresden, and to even defeat a Prussian army Frederick dispatches to force him back out of Saxony. But even then, von Don doesn't have enough supplies to keep his own men in good supply. He's forced to withdraw most of his army back to Austria and leave a garrison in Dresden. All of this, the conquest into Saxony, the withholding of supplies to Russian troops, this all exacerbates tensions between Austria and Russia even further. And moreover, Elizabeth Petrovna does not want to see Frederick the Great destroyed. She wants Prussia reduced to the level of a minor power again. Erasing Prussia from the map, presumably giving most of that area to Austria, or at least putting it back in Austria's sphere, well, that's just going to upset the balance of power in Austria's favor. What's in that for Russia in the long run? From Maria Theresa's perspective, it's exactly the opposite. Not only are the Russians being a little bit provocative by trying to conquer East Prussia, not just help out in the war, but actually take Prussian land, land that is awfully close to Central Europe, well, this makes Russia look like it's horning in on the Austrian Empire's sphere of influence. And besides which, she does want Frederick completely annihilated, if possible. She wants control of Central Germany, Central Europe, really, for Austria alone. And it's also more than geopolitics for her. It's personal. She can't stand Frederick. And Maria Theresa is already aggravating Elizabeth by dragging out the ongoing peace negotiations and prolonging the war. And now it looks like she's holding out on supplies as well. It looks really bad. And oh yes, Elizabeth Petrovna is going through a health crisis at the moment and has no time or patience for annoying allies. Despite all of this, while we can say that relations between Austria and Russia are frayed at the time, they both still have an interest in staying in this war. Neither one wants Frederick to come out with an advantage. So Elizabeth Petrovna and Maria Theresa are going to continue cooperating. And so the end of 1759 finds Frederick in slightly a worse position than where he began it. He has, first and foremost, lost Dresden, 
which is a big deal, not just because of its wealth and population, but it's a big deal from a symbolic and morale perspective. If you remember, Frederick's first big win at the beginning of the war was his lightning conquest of Saxony. And now he's just lost the Saxon capital. And besides losing territory, Frederick has also lost a lot of well-trained men. And when you replace trained men with untrained men, it takes some time to bring them up to snuff. And finally, he's lost a lot of material, particularly artillery. That's just stuff, but it's stuff that will be hard to replace, at least in the short term, in a wartime situation. And 1760 isn't much better for Frederick. On the plus side, the British and Hanoverian armies will defeat a French attack. Yet another one, and this will prevent the French from A, making any gains, or B, taking part in any meaningful way in the fighting against Prussia. And if you wanted a World War parallel, this is a good one. The French and the British are both powerful countries, capable of supplying an army in the field almost indefinitely. And they're almost evenly matched, so... When one side or the other scores a victory, they're not able to follow up with a war-ending strike on the enemy. They're either too worn down or the enemy still presents too much of a threat. It's not trench warfare like the Western Front in World War I, but they keep taking some land from the French or the Austrians, losing it again, then pushing the French back again, and... If you're one of those guys in Hanover and you've just fought your fourth major battle or your fifth or your sixth in as many years for no appreciable gain, it's got to be frustrating. But despite the apparent stalemate between the French and the British, the year 1760 still goes very well for the Franco-Austrian alliance as a whole, And not so well for Frederick the Great or Prussia. Much of the credit for this goes to an Austrian general named Ernst Gideon von Lauden. Von Lauden is an experienced commander who led the contingent of Austrian troops that fought with Saltykov's Russians in the Battle of Kunersdorf. And he has impressed Maria Theresa so much that she makes him commander-in-chief in Bohemia, Moravia, and Silesia. This makes him equal to von Don in rank, with each man in command of his own army. But while von Don is infuriatingly cautious, von Lauden is known for his aggression. Maria Theresa wants to win this war. And that means taking the fight to Frederick, not sitting back and trying to outmaneuver the guy who wrote the book on 18th century military maneuvering. And Maria Theresa thinks that von Lauden has what it takes to beat Frederick. In his book, History of the Habsburg Empire, American historian John S.C. Abbott writes, quote, The spring of 1760 found all parties eager for the renewal of the strife, but none more so than Maria Theresa. The King of Prussia was, however, in a deplorable condition. The veteran army, in which he had taken so much pride, was now annihilated. With despotic power, he had assembled a new army, but it was composed of peasants, raw recruits, but poorly prepared to encounter the horrors of war. The Allies were marching against him with 250,000 men. Frederick, with his utmost efforts, could muster but 75,000, who, to use his own language, were half peasants, half deserters from the enemy, 
soldiers no longer fit for service, but only for show. End quote. Frederick's problems go far beyond manpower, though. See, he is also struggling financially. Dennis Showalter writes, quote, Prussia's tax structure was heavily based on indirect levies whose continued collection implied a strong and stable economy. By 1760, circumstances had changed. Prussia's geographic heartland remained intact, but revenues from the border provinces either were not forthcoming at all, as was the case in East Prussia, or fell off sharply, as in Pomerania, where the Swedes remained a constant threat and a viable excuse. Even before the war, moreover, Prussia's trade had been affected adversely by a general economic downturn in Central Europe. A poor harvest in 1756, made worse by the absence of Cantonists who, recalled to active service, had been and unable to plant or harvest, had generated a steep initial rise in the price of food and agricultural products. The transformation of the prosperous regions of Saxony and Silesia into theaters of war disrupted industrial production and commercial distribution. Inflation reduced the value both of fixed salaries and of government contracts negotiated on long-term bases. Frederick met the challenge by biting the bullet and debasing Prussia's currency. As early as November 1757, the royal plate was converted into coin at the rate of 21 tailors per mark of silver, instead of the usual 14. By December 1759, the official ratio was almost 20 to 1. Saxon currency was debased to an even greater extent. Frederick's officials took advantage of Poland's long-standing contract with the Saxon Mint to issue Polish coins of slightly more than one-third of their official silver content. The English subsidy for 1759 had been coined into 5.3 million tailors. The subsidy for 1760 produced another million tailors from the same amount of bullion, a piece of fiscal sleight of hand that not even the king's most ardent supporters could ignore. Frederick was all too conscious of the long-term consequences of his inflationary monetary policy. The Prussian tailor lacked the historic credibility of the pound sterling, but nevertheless had been one of the stronger currencies of Central Europe. Diminishing confidence in its acceptability was an expenditure of public resources at least as debilitating as more obvious outlays of blood and treasure. Combined with strict and comprehensive instructions that the new coins be accepted as full-value payments for government purchases, while at the same time forbidding their acceptance by government agencies, the monetary reform enabled Frederick to put approximately 100,000 men in uniform into the field for the campaign of 1760. The choice of words reflects the fact that many of the men were hardly soldiers in the sense in which Prussia had understood the term in 1756, or even in 1759. End quote. It's worth noting that Austria's situation also isn't ideal financially, in 1758, Maria Theresa had pawned her jewelry collection to help fund the war. And in 1760, she will announce a public fund for private individuals to donate to the war effort. But all in all, Austria is still in a stronger position economically, and they're able to field a larger army. In late spring 1760, von Lauten leads his superior army into Silesia and lays siege to the fortress city of Glatz. His army surrounds the city on June 6th, but there's a delay because he's still waiting for his big siege artillery to arrive. During this time, Frederick hears of the attack and dispatches a force of 8,000 men under Heinrich August de la Montfouquet to relieve Glatz. Von Lauden marches out to meet them, and while Fouquet leads a gallant charge against Lauden's army, his men are hopelessly outnumbered. 
they end up surrounded by the Austrians and forced to form into a square. And only when they run out of ammunition do von Lauden's men cut their way through. It comes down to saber fighting, and Fouquet himself takes three cuts before he's taken prisoner. And there's one of these little stories of chivalry here that may or may not be true. But according to some accounts, an Austrian colonel offers his horse to the wounded Fouquet so he can presumably go and get stitched up. Fouquet protests that he might ruin the colonel's expensive saddle with his blood. And the colonel says, My saddle can only gain from being stained by the blood of a hero. You can decide for yourself whether or not that's true, but even if it isn't, it demonstrates the kind of behavior that people at the time would have idealized. Having defeated the Prussian relief force quite decisively, von Lauden settles in with his cannons and pounds the city of Glatz into submission. The defenders surrender on July 26th, and von Lauden achieves in a few months what von Don has so far failed to do in a few years of war. He has established clear Austrian control of territory in Silesia, and if you'll remember, the original point of this war from the Austrian perspective was to regain Silesia from the Prussians. Meanwhile, Frederick has been trying to retake Dresden with his main army. At one point, he gets close enough that the Austrians have to burn the suburbs to make the walls easier to defend. Prussian artillery pounds Dresden and ignites a fire that burns down over 400 buildings. At one point, the Austrians launch a night attack against one Prussian position occupied by the Bernberg Infantry Regiment, takes them completely by surprise and takes all of their guns as they scatter. Frederick has the entire regiment punished. The regular soldiers of the Bernberg Infantry Regiment have their swords taken away, and the officers have the ceremonial knots cut from their uniforms. But despite the shelling and the strict Prussian discipline, Dresden does not surrender, and Frederick is eventually forced to back off for lack of ammunition. Instead, he orders the countryside pillaged in order to gather anything of value he can. To conserve his regular troops, much of the pillaging is done by irregulars. Frederick even has a subordinate, a guy who I guess likes to cosplay as a Roman in a sense. He calls himself Quintus Icilius, and he leads a band of thugs called the Free Roman Legion. And these guys are given free reign to take anything of value that they can find in Saxony, as long as Frederick gets his cut. Anyway, Frederick has to go back to Silesia to do something about the Austrians. And von Lauden and von Don coordinate their movements and decide to bring both of their armies to bear on Frederick at the same time. Against the combined might of two Austrian armies, Frederick will stand no chance. A decisive victory could be the dagger in Prussia's heart, but the two Austrian leaders' command styles work against them. Von Lauden has an opportunity to launch a surprise night attack on Frederick's army. So, instead of sticking to the plan and waiting for Von Don's army to arrive, he attacks Frederick right away. And instead of outnumbering the Prussians by 100,000 to 30,000, the Austrians only have around 25,000 men present. But they do have the element of surprise on their side. At 3 a.m. on the morning of August 15, 1760, 
Von Lawden's cavalry launch a surprise attack on Frederick's camp. While they're taken by surprise, the Prussians hold their discipline and push the cavalry back. In fact, the heroes of the day are none other than the Bernberg Infantry Regiment, the guys who Frederick had punished for running away during the night attack outside Dresden. They fix their bayonets and launch a countercharge against the Austrian cavalry. It takes a lot of guts to charge against men on horseback when you're on foot, and the Austrians aren't going to take their chances against guys with that kind of guts, so they run away. During the charge, the Bernbergers shout, Honor or death, and they get their wish. After the battle, Frederick will restore their honor in the form of their swords and ceremonial knots. Following the failure of his initial cavalry charge, von Lauden opens up with his artillery, and the Prussians return fire. Frederick's artillery commander offers a reward of ten tailors to any artillerist who can take out an Austrian gun. One of the gunners does better and lands a lucky shot on the Austrian powder supply wagon, which explodes in a huge fireball. And in the wake of this giant traumatic explosion to the Austrians, Frederick leads his men in a general charge against his demoralized enemy. The fighting is fierce, and he is even grazed by a bit of grape shot, but the Austrian army quickly collapses. They've lost more than 8,000 men compared to just over 3,000 Prussian losses. They've also lost 80 artillery pieces, which Frederick can use to replenish his own depleted artillery. Von Lauden blames Von Don for his loss, since Von Don was slow to keep up while they moved in on Frederick. Von Don blames Von Lauden for being too aggressive and for not waiting to make a joint attack as planned, and to be fair, there is plenty of blame to go around. This is a war that the Austrians really should have won by now, and while Frederick's military brilliance, as well as that of his sub-commanders, certainly deserves some credit, this war is really the story of incompetent Austrian leadership, and I will get off my soapbox now, because either way, the Austrians have taken a bloody nose, regardless of who's to blame, and they're going to need some time to regroup. Throughout the rest of the summer and early fall, Frederick manages to hold the Austrians at bay in Silesia. He also has a second army in Saxony, which keeps the Austrians from advancing from the southwest. But the heartland in Brandenburg, around Berlin, is vulnerable. On October 3, 1760, Russian Count Tottelben leads a force of 15,000 Russians and 5,600 Cossacks in a blitz attack on Berlin. He plans to take the city by surprise, but his men are spotted from a while away. Frederick's favorite cavalry commander, Frederick Wilhelm von Seydlitz, happens to be in Berlin at the time recovering from injuries, as does General Hans von Lewald, who you may also remember. And von Seydlitz, despite his injuries, immediately takes command of the city's cavalry garrison and charges out at the attacking Russians, who have to deploy in formation now because of this threat instead of just charging up and into the city. Von Seydlitz does not have enough cavalry to actually drive the Russians off or defeat them, but what he does is he buys the rest of Berlin's garrison enough time to prepare their defenses and close all of the city's gates. 
And so when von Seidlitz returns inside the walls with the cavalry, the Russians are not simply able to storm the city. They're going to have to settle down and win a good old-fashioned siege. Count Tottleben does the good old-fashioned thing people do when they want to avoid a siege and instead demands a ransom of two million tailors. In exchange, he will spare the city. The Berliners refuse, and reinforcements pour in from throughout northern Germany. The Prussians basically remove almost all of the troops who were bottling up the Swedish in the north just to come and defend Berlin. And this action brings the defenders' numbers to around 18,000. But then, an Austrian army arrives to join the Russians with an additional 15,000 men. And faced with overwhelming odds, the city council decides to surrender to avoid the total destruction of the city of Berlin. And the defenders quietly retreat to Spandau, which is a nearby city, and the Russians enter Berlin on October 7th. And since they have had to go through the trouble of laying a siege, they raise their ransom demand to a whopping four million tailors, or Tottleben will let his men plunder the city. And for a minute, it looks like the Berliners won't be able to come up with the ransom. But then, an unlikely hero steps onto the stage a silk merchant named Johann Ernst Gutzkowski. Gutzkowski is one of Berlin's leading businessmen. His silk factory employs more than 1,500 workers, and after the Prussian defeat at the Battle of Kunersdorf, he's gone to visit Frederick to ask what he could do. Frederick, at the time, advised him to tell the other merchants that he couldn't protect Berlin and that they may want to move their business elsewhere. But Godzkowski responded that the merchants would never abandon Berlin. So Frederick had given him royal authority to look after the interests of the capital, as vague of a mandate as that might be, but Johann Ernst Gutzkowski has spent the last year or so gathering most of the gold in the city he has convinced the other leading merchants that something like this might happen and they have put their gold into his house. And Gotskovsky pretends to the Russians that there's way less money than there is. And he asks Count Tottleben to be reasonable and to accept an amount that the people can actually come up with. And he talks him down to 1.5 million tailors, which if you're paying attention, was less than Tottleben had asked for before the siege, but maybe he's not a very good businessman, who knows, but Tottleben agrees on the condition that Gotzkowski will let himself be taken hostage until the full amount is paid. See, the Berliners only pay 200,000 tailors in hard currency. The rest is in the form of promissory notes, and Tattleben doesn't want the merchants going back on their word once his men leave the city. So when the Russians leave Berlin, they leave it relatively unscathed. The worst that can be said is that some Cossacks vandalized a few marble statues, although the Russians also take with them 130 11 and 12-year-old cadets from the military school. And, of course, they take Johann Ernst Gotzkowski. But while the Russians are withdrawing, some Prussian cavalry are raiding in the area, and they attack the Cossacks who happen to be holding Gotzkowski. So he is able to get free and get back to Frederick and explain to him everything that has happened. And Frederick says to go back to the merchants and tell them not to pay their promissory notes. 
Frederick's going to pay their debts himself. So when the Russians get their ransom, it doesn't come in the form of gold, which the merchants had been holding, but it comes in the form of Frederick's cheap, debased currency that he's been inflating. Uh, the Russians get cheated, and as for Gotskovsky, Frederick rewards him with a porcelain-making business, which makes him even richer than before. At this point, Maria Theresa is getting even more impatient with Von Don. He is moving too slowly, as usual. And she orders him that if he is not able to go on the offensive, he is still to defend Austria's gains in Saxony at all costs even if it means fighting a battle under unfavorable conditions. So against his timid instincts, Von Don occupies some old Prussian defenses near the town of Torgau. This is a solid defensive location. It's a high ridge overlooking the largest crossing on the middle of the Elba River. If Frederick's army is going to cross from Prussian-occupied Saxony to Austrian-occupied Saxony, they will most likely come through here. By now, in the late fall, Frederick has grown his main army to around 50,000 men. Vandon has a few thousand more than that with him in Saxony, but nothing that gives him any serious numeric edge. But Battles favor the defender, and on a high ridge with roughly equal numbers, Von Don has the advantage on paper. On November 2nd, 1760, Frederick crosses his army over the Elba, within sight of Von Don's lookouts. Now, Von Don does not move off of his position to oppose Frederick's crossing. He is going to sit on his ridge and make Frederick knock him off it. That evening, Frederick meets with his officers and says, quote, This war is lasting too long for me. It must be boring for you, too. We are therefore going to end it tomorrow. End quote. The Prussians plan a two-pronged attack. Frederick will lead the main assault through some woods to the north of the Austrian ridge. These woods will give his men cover until they're very close to the base of the ridge, so while they will still be attacking uphill, which is not ideal, they will at least be somewhat shielded from the enemy as they move into position. Simultaneously, General Hans Joachim von Zieten another of the guys who has helped build Prussia's feared hussars, well, he will lead a diversionary attack around the south side of the ridge. This will force Von Don to extend his lines to protect the entire ridge perimeter, hopefully weakening them enough for Frederick's main attack to punch through from the north. The Prussian army decamps at dawn on November 3rd, and things go badly from the start. As Zieten tries to quietly sneak around the ridge, his men encounter a force of light Croatian infantry. This is just a screening force, and the Croatians run away almost as soon as they make contact but they are able to warn the rest of the Austrian army about the attack from the rear. So von Don starts redeploying his men in a big rectangle. Now, this does achieve the goal of spreading out the Austrian lines, but it happens too soon since Zieten has not gotten around to the south yet. He's not even in a position to do any damage before the Austrians kind of harden their defenses. It's about noon at this point, and Frederick only has some of his men deployed yet. 
But when he hears Zeton coming under heavy fire on the other side of the ridge, he decides to attack immediately with the troops he currently has available. This turns out to be a disaster. See, Frederick has several large howitzers with his army that can make quick work of the Austrian artillery on the ridge. But they are heavy and slow-moving, and only a couple of them have completed the 12-hour trip from the Prussian camp. They're still being brought up. So when Frederick sends his 10,000 grenadiers forward, some of his best troops... Half of them are killed and the rest are forced back. With fresh reinforcements, these men launch a second charge and they get into a close-range musket duel with the Austrians. For a minute, it looks like they may punch through, but von Don sends out his cavalry to push them back down the ridge. Frederick's force is only saved by the timely arrival of his cavalry. The Prussian cavalry not only drives the Austrian cavalry away, but charges all the way up to the top of the ridge, where they break through the first line of defenders. Unfortunately, instead of continuing to charge through the second line of defenders, they stop to round up prisoners and haul away captured cannons which gives the Austrian cavalry time to regroup and countercharge them, pushing them back off the ridge. At this point, it is late in the afternoon, and things do not look good for Frederick. Most of his crack grenadiers are dead or wounded. His other troops are out of formation and fighting as individual units, which is what often happens before an army breaks altogether. And around 4.30, he takes either a musket ball or a piece of shrapnel to the chest. He's at extreme range, and apparently it just bounces off, but it shakes up his aides enough that they force him to withdraw to a nearby church. To the south, von Zieten has slowly been pushing his way through a bunch of that Croatian light infantry. There's a lot of gunfire going off in the area, which is what had alarmed Frederick, but his men are only taking slight losses. On the other hand, it is slow going, but by late afternoon, they have finally managed to drive the Croatians completely off of an area near the far end of the ridge, and they have opened access to a narrow stretch of ground between two ponds. This causeway gives direct access to the ridge, and von Zieten spurs his cavalry across, with his infantry following close behind. They manage to capture several Austrian artillery pieces and turn them on the Austrians further down the ridge, who are now caught between Frederick's remaining soldiers in the north and von Zieten's fresh troops coming up from the south. As darkness falls, the Austrians withdraw across the Elba River, putting some distance between themselves and the Prussians. But this Prussian victory has come at an incredible cost. Roughly a third of each army lies dead or wounded, and years of war are taking their toll on both sides, but particularly on Prussia, which has a smaller population. After the battle, Frederick writes to a friend, quote, We have just beaten the Austrians. We both lost a great many people. Perhaps this victory will afford us some peace and quiet during the winter, and that is about it. I received a shot which tore up the top of my chest, but it is just a contusion, a bit of pain but no danger, and it won't stop me from going about my business. End quote. We'll leave Frederick the Great here for now. At the end of 1760, his position is more tenuous than ever. He's still in control of about half of Saxony, but the Austrians have maintained their foothold in Silesia. 
and the Russian dagger remains not far from Berlin, ready to strike again whenever they finally get their supply issues in order. And if you're wondering what the Swedish are doing all this time, they can't seem to decide whether they're in this war or not. They keep making incursions into Prussian Pomerania but can't hold land. They can just really make raids. In part, this is because of poor funding. It seems that while the ruling Hats Party's aggressive foreign policy is popular, paying taxes to support the military is not. And that, in a nutshell, is Sweden's story in the Seven Years' War. Meanwhile, on the Indian subcontinent, the British are taking complete control. In 1760, they defeat a combined French Maratha force at the Battle of Wandiwash, and in 1761, the last French settlement in India, Pondicherry, falls into British hands. Further north on the Indian coast, in Bengal, the British East India Company stages yet another coup, further cementing their control of the region. While Frederick fights for survival and the French and Austrians battle to maintain the status quo, Britain is building its global empire. Will Frederick the Great manage to survive his war against three world powers? Will Maria Theresa regain her rightful land in Silesia, and will the French be able to salvage anything at all in their war against the British? We will cover all those things and more in the conclusion of World War Zero. Hello again. It's me, Dan. This is a friendly reminder that if you're only listening to the audio podcast, you're not getting all of my content. I also have a Patreon channel called Dan's War College. Each month, I break down a historical battle, weapon, or tactic and explain how it works. This is a video series with maps, graphics, and other helpful visual aids, and you can get it all for just $5 a month. We've done 10 episodes so far, and some of these have even been patron requests, because I do take requests. You can find the link to the Patreon channel in the episode description. And if you're on the fence, episode 5 of Dan's War College is currently publicly available, so you can check that one out and get a taste for what the channel is like. Of course, not everybody wants to spend $5 a month for a monthly video, and who can blame you? There are so many channels and subscription services out there that it's just impossible to sign up for all of them. But if you still want to support the show, you can share it with your friends or post a link on social media. Shows like this grow by word of mouth. And if the channel's growth is any indication, you guys are great advertisers. Thanks so much, and please keep it up. And if your podcast service lets you leave a review, please do so. If you want to follow Relevant History on social media, you can find links in the description for that as well. Or just go to Twitter and find at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast. If you want to send me an email, you can write to dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast at gmail.com. Tell me what you liked, or if you think I got something wrong, tell me that too. You can also visit the show's website at dantollerpodcast.com. Once again, that's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.